Thanks everyone for coming. Um, hope you're enjoying the show so far. Uh, just a little bit about me. I've been at Pratt Miller a little bit over 10 years. Um, we've gone from about 100, 100 employees when I started there to over 350 now. Um, we've got several facilities between Michigan and North Carolina, um, and I'm here to tell you uh, how we are racing into the future with 3D technology. So. A little bit about Pratt & Miller first. So Pratt & Miller was founded in 1989 um, and we're now approaching our 30th year in business. Uh, we've experienced pretty good growth in the last 10 years, like I mentioned. Um, the employee counts increased over 200%. We currently have three engineering and manufacturing facilities in Michigan and then two facilities in North Carolina. The thing that we are mostly known for is our motorsports heritage. That's where we got started. That's where the first 20-ish uh, years were for Pratt & Miller. Corvette racing is the main program we're known for. Uh, we also do a lot of other support of other GM racing programs. So our motorsports uh, participation is exclusive to GM. Um, we've been working with them since the Corvette program started about 20 years ago. Uh, in that time, we've compiled over 107 class wins, including eight victories in our class at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. If anyone's familiar with racing, you know that's kind of a big deal. Um, and we have also gotten 12 team championships in that time between the American Le Mans series and the IMSA series. Um, we also support GM in their NASCAR, IndyCar, and other kinds of sports car and GT racing. Um, and we've developed a lot of tools and methods and processes that uh, have been developed in racing and applied to our other work. And then they are also uh, feeding information back and forth between the two uh, sides of the business now. One of the major industries that we've gotten into outside of motorsports is the defense industry. So we tend to focus on the mobility aspects, survivability for the occupants, and then also into uh, robotic stuff. So um, we can do everything from simple part designs, uh, you know, studies, clean sheet design, develop, test a complete vehicle. Um, we can pretty much do that whole thing. And you can see a wide selection of the different types of vehicles and projects that we've, uh, we've done in the defense industry up there on the slide. The other major area is mobility, which kind of sums up the automotive, power sports, and anything else uh, mobility-wise. Uh, we are very strong in vehicle dynamics, aerodynamics, light weighting, composites, um, electrified or automated vehicles, vehicle dynamics, CAE, and uh, active systems. Um, and we use those, like I said, in the automotive, power sports, and commercial uh, mark vehicle markets in particular. Another big area that we try to participate in is product innovation. So um, you'll see a picture of the space station up there. We do have a couple of projects and parts that we've worked on that are up on the space station. Um, and we try and push ourselves by taking on things that are outside of our normal wheelhouse just to kind of grow ourselves and see how different industries work. And a great example is the work that we've done for NASA. Our product development life cycle is um, our major selling point. Uh, we can offer, as I mentioned, everything from the research stage through engineering design, prototype build, uh, test and development of the program, and then using that test and development information to go on into low rate production, which is something we've just gotten into in the last couple of years. Uh, we can take the project pretty much from the cradle to the grave. You have an idea, we can start with that, and then down the road you have a vehicle that you can market and sell and hopefully produce uh, at least a low rate production level of. Pratt and & Miller and Farrow Technologies have a long partnership spanning over a decade now. Uh, the relationship existed before I started working there, so it uh, pre-existed me at Pratt & Miller. Uh, in that time, we've evolved from being world-renowned operation in professional motorsports, and we've evolved into an innovative full-service engineering and manufacturing company today, so we've used that processes and uh, technology that we've, uh, of the Faro technology to uh, apply to all of our other industries. So you'll see our Corvette racing car up there from the 24 Hours of Le Mans this year um, with the Faro logo on it. They usually ride along for our 24 Hours of Le Mans, so uh, it's great to have them along and have grown with them um, and using all of their technology to succeed. You can see here a uh, kind of a wide array of the technology that's in this room. Uh, we've used most of it and some of the stuff that's up there that we haven't used we are looking to apply into our low volume production programs as they're coming online. So 
our process, like I said, we can take it from the initial idea on through the end uh, of having a complete vehicle. So often that starts with some reverse engineering. You'll see up here on the slide uh, some examples of some projects where we started. Uh, one is a Modus motorcycle, and the other one is our C6 RS Corvette that we made about 10 years ago. Um, those, for instance, started out as clay models, so we didn't want to spend the time and money that it takes to do full surfacing in CAD. So we started out with a clay buck so the styling guys could get that as close as they wanted, get all the lines correct, and then those were laser scanned, turned into models, so that actual parts could be made off of them. Um, the technical advantage that this gives us is, in this case, we, uh, we allow the design, you know, the the non-CAD designer to, uh, to do their work and make it all pretty and then we can digitize that and get it into a format that is usable to make molds off of for body work. Um, we also do a lot of hard point measurement to get uh, interfaces for uh, parts to mate together that we cannot get a CAD model for so it's really helpful to get quickly acquired measurements that our CAD guys can use to actually start creating data so that we can start building uh, parts or vehicles. So kind of the next step is once you have a design, we go through and uh, build fixtures. And one of the things that we use the arm for that there's really no other good way to do it with the size of the span of the fixtures. So these are chassis fixtures for one of our racing programs. We'll actually move the fire arm out into the shop floor and put the magnetic base in between the fixtures. And that will uh, allow us to align the two fixtures as close as possible to each other uh, so that we're starting out at the best point. So in, in the past, we had done up to the point where we bring the fire arm over there. We'll use scales and dial indicators and things like that to get them close. Um, and at that, in the past, before we used the arm, that would be where it ended. Now we're able to get the extra 15 or 20 thousandths of accuracy that we couldn't get with those manual tools by using the arm. So the portability out to the shop floor makes it uh, a great thing to, uh, to be able to give us the best possible starting point for our projects. Um, we also do inspections of our smaller fixtures for control arms or cradles or whatever small weldment um, in the same manner, but obviously they don't have the span that these do. Uh, a major thing that we use the laser line probe technology for is for inspecting all of our composite molds and tooling and uh, even some parts inspection. Um, you know, these are th pretty complex 3D shapes. They're not easy to measure. Um, we make primarily our molds out of resin tooling board, but we'll also make some out of metal, um, fiberglass, carbon fiber. Um, a typical race car build can have over 100 molds, so that's a lot of parts and molds to inspect, and it typically happens in a pretty truncated time frame. Uh, in motorsports, the time frame that you have to actually build the car after you've designed it and it needs to hit the track is shorter than in most industries. So this is a big advantage for us, being able to quickly inspect an output. Um, you can see the heat maps there with the deviation uh, from the CAD nominals. Um, you can see up in the top right for you guys, uh, the new blue line and green line lasers can actually scan the bare carbon, um, which is uh, something that was a challenge in the past for the red lasers. So that is actually a pretty, pretty good thing that uh, the technology has come that far. Um, and limiting the time on these inspections just increases our profitability and allows the molds to continue along to our composites group and allow them to get to work on prepping them and actually building parts again. Uh, we do a lot of in-process inspections, so things that are not quite done, but we need to know that our setup is good. Uh, we can do it out on the shop floor, as you can see on the left. And uh, on the right there, you can see a small machine part that's partially manufactured uh, and just verifying that the setup was good before we go on and make more of them. Um, the portability and versatility of the arm and being able to take it out into the shop fo floor for something that that's that is that large is a p kind of a big deal for us. We do a lot of uh, larger components for our defense and commercial vehicle projects. So um, just being able to know that the fabricators have everything set up before it goes into a machine or off to a customer is a great thing. And then obviously the smaller machine parts, we're making lots and lots of those. So just making sure you're all good to go before you tell the operator to 
get running on his parts uh, is, a, is a big deal for us. We also do a lot of, you know, formal final first articles and final inspections. So we have a wide variety of parts. Um, you know, you can see kind of a selection of those parts there on the screen. Uh, we have a, the ability to quickly inspect these parts to the CAD model, uh, which is a big deal for us. Uh, it allows us to figure out all the whole locations and make sure they're intolerance or not to the CAD model. and. Uh, doesn't require a bunch of programming since our part batches are smaller um, and it's very intuitive to use. Uh, there's some, some of our employees have not had any experience with it and have picked it up quite quickly um, as long as they're comfortable with that computer CAD interface. Um, so for these small batch uh, parts, you know, a gantry CMM is not really the practical thing for a lot of them. The tolerances don't require, you know, a super precise submicron accuracy, and uh, this allows us to get the throughput that we need to do to execute our projects, and also helps provide the cost savings because you're not eating up valuable time in programming. This is just another example of some of the first article and final inspections. It was kind of a cool project we got to do. I mentioned the space station. So this is the Robonaut 2. So this is one of the things that is up on the space station. When it launched originally, it was just a torso. Uh, and then these components here you see on the screen are actually the leg joint components. They're all hiding under his white uh, shrouds there. But um, you can see the legs look kind of weird, but they are so that he can grab onto the rails in the space station and do the work that was intended uh, to keep the, um, the astronauts working on their experiments. Since it's expensive to have them up there, it's a lot easier to have a robot to uh, do the cleaning of vents and things like that that uh, we don't want to have those astronauts spending the time on. Um, and once again, you know, the ability to, these parts are fairly complex and to quickly inspect them and uh, hit the timing that was required for NASA. We also do a lot of assembly shop floor measurement support. So this is a pretty cool project. It was uh, for DARPA. It was the GXVT METS project. And the METS part of it stands for the multi-mode extreme travel suspension. As you can see, it's got some fairly ex extreme travel. Um, in this case, the portability of the fire arm allowed us to move it into the shop floor, into a secured area to do a variety of measurements for setting up drive line and suspension components. This is a fairly complex vehicle. It's a lot of stuff that has ever been tried, and uh, we wanted to make sure we were giving ourselves the best starting point before they went out to test the vehicle uh, to eliminate as many possible sources of problems. Um, if we didn't have the portability of the arm, we wouldn't have been able to do a lot of that, and we might have had a lot more teething problems, and that would not have been good with the limited testing time that we had for this project. Um, so that was a big, big business advantage for us was being able to actually verify all that and work with the techs out on the floor to make sure that the vehicle was as ready to go as possible since it was trying out so much new technology. So you can see it's uh, pretty impressive what it can handle up there. We also do a lot of measurements to help correlate our uh, simulations to test data that we acquire. One of the big things um, that we did uh, in the past five years was uh, the IndyCar Aero Kit for GM for the Chevy teams. Um, you can see the wind tunnel model there on the right and the CF one of the screenshots of some of the CFD there on the left. So they'll go through and do multiple iterations in CFD to figure out um, those of you who don't know, CFD is computational fluid dynamics, so just trying to see what the air actually does. Um, so they'll go through multiple iterations of design of different aerodynamic components for the car, trying to maximize the downforce and minimize the drag. So they'll do that in the computer before they make parts. Then they'll do scale model wind tunnel testing, and that's what's there on the right. They'll be able to swap out the different parts that they decided they wanted to test. They acquire all that data. They get back to the to the office, they start analyzing the data, and some of the things don't quite match up. <clears throat> so then they'll have us measure various areas of the car to see what discrepancies there are from their design intent to see if it's reality or is this just some manufacturing scaling defect or something like that, just to help them understand. And that lets them sharpen the sword of their, uh, their model in the CFD program. The next iterations for the next test are uh, are better and then they hone that over years. Uh, this program lasted a few years before it actually raced and uh, 
it hit the hit the ground running, and uh, all of that work actually allowed us to win 34 of the 49 races against Honda. So our kit was far superior with our testing methods. Um, so that was a that was definitely a big deal being able to correlate those models to the actual computer simulations. As I mentioned, we do a lot of this correlation support. So another th example, uh, very different from the uh, the CFD wind tunnel correlation is. Uh, we do a lot of vehicle dynamics modeling for the military vehicles, and then they'll obviously build it and go out and test. And when they go out and test, the data doesn't quite match. Um, they were thinking that, well, maybe the test course isn't exactly what it was intended on being. So the next time we went out and tested, we used a focus scanner to actually scan the, the test course and then handed that data off to our vehicle dynamics modelers. And that allowed them to mine that data to learn what the discrepancies were and improve their model significantly. So that's a big deal just for improving those tools over time. Correlation of modeling to reality um, is just something you're constantly, constantly trying to improve. Another example of some test, cor or, or test data to model correlation was for our CAMEL program that we did for TARDEC. So this is a next generation troop transport. So it started out with them doing blast simulations, preparing for blast testing. Um, so the whole idea of this program was to make a concept for next generation troop transport that's actually a lot safer for the occupant. It's centered around the occupants being safe in a underbelly IED blast. So we wanted the best starting point for our manufacturing. So we did all the simulation first and then actually go out and do the testing. And then when we get the, uh, the test asset back, we would scan it either with the arm and detail areas or with the focus scanner and acquire that data and then compare it to what the uh, expected deformation was and then go on from there and improve that over the, uh, the life of the program to kind of far exceed the expectations of uh, what was actually possible. So that's a big deal and you know, personal little anecdote, this project, um, we started out with a a wooden simulated interior to get feedback from the soldiers. And uh, our team went out to a military base out in Washington state. And uh, my younger brother was actually in the army at the time and got assigned to help out with the, with the program. And it kind of hit a little closer to home because my brother was on a striker crew. And this is something that's designed to kind of replace that in the future. So uh, knowing his griped about that and how kind of crammed in there they are and unsafe they are, you know, it hit a little closer to home that we're doing this kind of work. So that was kind of a additional cool thing that we were, we were able to do something like that for the servicemen. And that is all I've got there. Anyone have any questions? Do you ever need to do full vehicle scan? We have in the past, yes. And, and what do you, how do you do that? Do you use laser? Do you use just vision to do a point map? Uh, it depends on what level of um, integrity they need for the data. You know, the focus scanner will get you close um, for, for that, but it's more intended for long range scanning. Um, a lot of times we'll do detail scanning with the laser line probe if we really need a really accurate, uh, accurate model. And then you can align the individual scans. You're obviously not going to do it from one position. You're going to scan, you know, the right front, and then you're going to move down a little bit, overlap slightly, scan a little bit more. Um, we've also done hard point scanning on a full vehicle for suspension um, points to know where they really are versus where they were intended to be. You know, once again, just trying to improve the correlation of reality to our modeling and just understand that better. Hi. Uh, going to the motorsport side of things, when you're doing you know, a car build, <clears throat> do you scan, you know, say you, you build a bare chassis, you know, um, tub, front and rear subframes, do you scan that as a complete, do you, like you say, pick up hard points for everything, or do you just kind of do one at the beginning and then once you know, individual components are done, then you're okay? Um, it depends on what the engineering team on that program wants to do. So sometimes we'll scan a chassis and just scan the chassis mount points. You know, the individual parts like a cradle, which is your lower points are going to go to, um, those are inspected separately. 
Um, we have done, you know, with suspension on measurements for the team. Uh, if they get in a bad wreck and we have to cut part of the chassis off and repair it, we'll go and verify that. We might not scan the whole vehicle. We might do, you know, say they stuff the right front in the fence and they have to cut it off and then weld on a new part of the frame. Then we'll verify that the front is square to each other and maybe hop down to that right rear just to make sure everything is square. Uh, we won't necessarily go to the left rear um, there, but it just kind of depends on what the needs are. You know, we don't want to just do it for the sake of doing it and acquiring data, um, you know, if they're not going to use it. But if they are, you know, it's just kind of up to those engineers what they're really concerned with. And do you, do you assist in race weekends with setups, or is it kind of done at the factory and then it's up to the race team to set up? Uh, so I, I do not. They have some pretty nifty setup gauges and stuff. Um, I have gone and helped out at races before, but I mostly uh, do not travel with the race team. Um, I have my own racing to do, and if you're on the road racing, you don't get to do that. <laughs> what, what do you race? Uh, Go-karts. So these are a little out of my budget. <laughs> Go-karting is still expensive. It's as cheap as you can race wheel-to-wheel -wheel with other people, though. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So GM gets involved in racing theoretically, so some of this stuff feeds into production. Are some of the things that you've done, do you know, gone into the production cars later on? We have a very close relationship with the Corvette production team, so those guys are in, you know, constantly... Um, meeting with our engineering team, and um, I think you'll see the step from the C6 to the C7 was pretty significant, and you know, definitely, you know, there's definitely a lot of communication there. You know, we work with them because we want a better race car, and they need to improve their car, and they want a better road car to sell to people. So yeah. it all works hand in hand. You know, a lot of racing is lip service to what you're talking about, but this is actually, you know, a road-based car. Um, you know, obviously it's you know, heavily modified to go racing, but um, it's still un underneath is a Corvette chassis and the body lines are obviously a little, you know, very similar. It's obviously wider and lower and has some different aerodynamics that you can't go over a speed bump with and, and those kind of things. But um, especially with the Corvette side of things, there's a very close relationship with production. And we also do a lot of um, non-motorsports R&D work with, with GM, so... And the other question I had was, uh, as far as a lot of their software has SPC type mm -hmm. data that's used, do you have applications for that in your environment? So we don't do a lot of SPC because, especially on the motorsports side, we're doing, you know, six of a right-hand part, six of a left-hand part, you know, so there's just not enough data in there to really no, but um, as we're getting more and more into the low volume production stuff, it's something that we're starting to do, uh, you know, in the defense and automotive work that we're doing. So not so much on the racing side of things. Um, you know, we have the data. We could pump it in to do a statistical analysis, but I don't know how much we'd get out of it. But it's something that we're definitely having to move towards as we're getting into some production work. Mm -hmm.